Yo, we live in difficult times. There's war, political unrest, the pandemic, poverty, families being torn, communities ripped by gun violence and people dying every day. Police, injustice, it's all bringing so much pain. But y'all, we can look inside our minds and we can understand who we are, become better, and do this thing like we've never done it before. But it all starts with our mental health and I know we can do it. I believe in you because I believe in me and I believe in us. A powerful cultural construct, our art, our social institutions, our achievements of particular nation, our people, social groups, American culture, baseball, football, basketball, hot dogs, steaks, hamburgers, the blues. Why do I feel so black and blue? Country, you can break my heart, achy, perky heart. Gospel, jazz, Najee, rock, pop, hip hop, and you don't stop. Gender roles, race, family, sexuality, beauty, size, shape, complex, and age. These are all things that's defined by our culture, image and shape. What messages do we give about height? Is it better to be tall or short? Our bill or shape, do they really matter? Complexion, is there really one better than another? Why is this true? Maybe a healthy glow can be any shade, if you're healthy, right? Perhaps we make changes to ourselves to make us feel better about who we are. There's a large cosmetic industry and we feel pushed to do all those things that have the ideal look. Where do we get this from? Our social constructs. Let me keep it real. There's a lot of people not liking themselves all that much these days and thinking and making a lot of changes to look more like someone or some idea on TV or, or in music they might have heard. Remember, that's all a show. The real you is what you feel inside. So don't let no society decide if you're good enough. Aggression, according to the journal Personality and Social Psychology, violent song lyrics increase negative emotions, thoughts that can contribute to aggression. We also want to give music credit for helping us improve our mental health. We also want to get music uh, credit for getting us in the mood. Because, you know, Marvin Gaye, he can get you in the mood, right? Of course, violent movies on TV have been an issue for about 55 years since everyone could have TV. I don't care what nobody say to me, but in America, as long as I can remember, there's been gangsters, there's been outlaws, let's say, um, Clint Eastwood, I believe a guy by the name of Charles Bronson. Come on. Oh, John Wick. Look, it's very violent, right? But it's a good movie. But it's a whole lot of dying going on in that movie. I mean, I think action movies are just the way to go, right? Like, you know. And of course, there's movies about love and romance. But we'll get to that. But many of the violent things that we watch may desensitize us to violence. And thus we might be more accustomed to not reacting to violence in a way that we should. You know, the central nervous system doesn't know that what we see is not real. So we are always trying to play this game with our emotions and our cognitions and our instinctive drives to keep us in a safe place. But maybe, just maybe, if you think about how you respond to some of the things you watch, you might notice your body's response. And it might be telling you it feels unsafe. Hey, speaking of glamorizing aggression, when I was a kid, I saw Nino Brown and I realized he was a cool dude. He might have been selling some illegal stuff, but the bruh had it going on. 
we 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 tend to make bad boys guys that do uh terrible things we tend to glorify their lives and their their stories in ways that makes that more appealing so when people choose or elect to embrace those lifestyles we might consider how the repeated stories and narratives around those kind of things may actually motivate those attitudes and behaviors. There's a lot of false narratives that influence how we approach relationships. You know, everybody, when you talk to them, there's such this romantic romanticism around relationships. You, I mean, think about all the movies that's about love and the stories they, they tell us about what love is. But really, is that true? Like, think about it. We should meet a person with extraordinary inner and outer beauty and feel immediate special attention, really, without really even getting to know them. We should always have highly satisfying sex. And, and in reality, there may be many ups and downs in the relationship and in sexual intensity. Never be attracted to anyone else like that's a crime. And who wants somebody that, hmm, that doesn't have taste or might find someone else attract, attractive or appealing? You probably got that person because they found you attractive. Hmm. There should be intuitive understanding without communication. Come on, y'all. We can't just follow our feelings. We need to plan. We need to talk. We need to have expectation. Don't have no secrets. Like, really? You're going to be in a relationship and a person is going to tell you everything? I'm sorry. You're probably better off if you don't know everything. But if you need to know everything, keep trying to find it out. You will not enjoy your experience because you're going to find something that you don't like. My mom used to always say, if you go looking for something, you'll find it. Now, if they're really a problem, you'll see it. You won't have to look that hard. But if you do find it, do something about it. Don't go find it and then keep doing the same thing or rationalize it in a way. Of course, you're going to spend a lot of time together, right? Having family and having children is not going to change your relationship. But yes, it will. Get used to it. Deal with it. My partner should be my everything. My best friend. Always be there for me to talk and express my emotions. Perhaps not always the case. Sometimes an outside voice can do good also because they ain't in your mess. According to the National Center on Drug Abuse Statistics, there has been over a million overdose deaths since 1999. Seven out of 10 of those deaths have been due to opioid use. In America, 139 million Americans, 12 and up, drank alcohol. Another 58.8 million used tobacco, which means alcohol and drugs account for more than 50% of the population. The federal budget for drug control is about 35 billion. Drug addiction costs the American society $740 billion in healthcare, crime, and lost productivity. You know, in my hood, where I've been at, just about everywhere you go, everywhere you go, you can find a liquor store on about every other corner. Hey, and don't think getting your liquor on Sunday morning and drinking your fifth or whatever it might be is not religion because ultimately religion is what's ultimately important to you and that practice in which you engage in. So if I... Ultimately, always want to, on a Sunday morning, get up and get my, my, my fifth or whatever I want to drink, and I do that, then that has now become my religion. I practice it on a routine. It has now become my religion. So you go to something. You do something. You just don't go to that, that, those other buildings. Another thing I want to say is everywhere you turn, there's a drugstore. I mean, it, it feels like in America we're always being marketed to around drugs and, and things we can use, like every pain, every problem that we have, there's something we can take to get over it, like we don't want to feel. And in reality, sometimes we do need to feel. We do need to deal with our emotions and our feelings around things. But our culture tells us it is weak to feel what you feel. 
that you don't have time to deal with your emotions. And so we use drugs, we use alcohol and other things that might be destructive in order for us to feel better in the moment. It's so in our, our culture. How many times have you watched a movie and not seen people drinking or celebrating or using uh, some type of drug? Foods, you know, I talked about hot dogs. Of course, they have nitrates in them and they're not good for us, but we eat hot dogs. But what about how much sugar we take in? Do you ever think about how much sugar you take into your body? Like we're so used to eating sugar that it seems weird. It seems terrible. It seems unthinkable not to use it. Hmm. You realize on average, Americans take in over 130 grams of sugar a day. And we only need to survive somewhere about 25 to 35 grams of sugar. We take in way more than we need. So we have so much diabetes and other health conditions because our sugar consumption is so high. But this is America. This is what we do because we've been doing it for a long time. So since my mama did it, since my daddy did it, then I think it's fine. I should continue eating that because everybody did it. Money and economics. Of course, money and economics, it creates a class system. And often it influences people's self-concept because everybody wants money. And when you don't have money, oftentimes you will feel like you are a failure, that you are not as smart or hardworking. Everyone remember the Protestant work ethic, the view that a person's duty is to achieve success through hard work and thrift, such success being a sign that one is saved. So perhaps maybe we don't have universal health care in America because we feel like those who don't have it really are not doing what they need to do to actually ascertain it. We feel that people who are poor don't have as much to give to society. Um, we feel that their health and well-being is not in, as important. A and we know this is not true, but when we are judged primarily by our financial outcomes, then it creates an environment where those who have less could be minimized and forgotten. And those who have more can be celebrated. And in all reality, only a small portion of our society really has all that wealth. But most of us, we are still struggling, trying to come up. But be careful not to believe that just having all the wealth will make you happy. Because happiness and wealth is not necessarily correlated. Because happiness is something that's deep inside. It's something that's the absence of fear, the absence of pain, the absence of sadness. And sometimes when we have more money, it does actually mean more problems. Think about the roles that you have today. Are your mother, are your father, are your wife, are your teacher, doctor? What does those roles say about you? How does those goals give you purpose and help you feel a part of your family, a part of your community? What are you expected to do? Sometimes our roles can be unrealistic. We were romanticized about what a, a wife should be or a girlfriend or a husband or a supervisor or a leader or a pastor or a police. We were romanticized about what these ideas are and we won't really understand what we realistically can do. So society may say we should do all these things, but what we really can do is important. So I want you to evaluate and think about who you are, what roles you have, and what is realistic expectations for you to be effective. As a therapist, I want to emphasize this because when we out here and trying to do the best that we can, 
understanding what we can control in our roles and mastering that is far more, more, far more effective than trying to be something that we can't be because we don't have the tools or resources to do that. Or that's just not who we are. So to be true to our authentic, to be true to our authentic selves is to know our roles, be comfortable in what we do, master that and leave the rest up to somebody else. Because if I'm going to be a therapist, I might as well be good at it. Right. If I'm going to be a doctor, I might as well be good at that. If I'm going to be a mother, I need to have realistic expectations about what it means to be a mother. And I need to have realistic expectations about what my child will and will not be because we can't say that our kids won't have this problem or have that problem, or they'll just be these perfect, great students and, and everything. And if they're not these things, Oh my God, my kid is just so bad. Oh my God. I hear that so much. Really? Like my kid told a lie. Okay. 12 year olds do that. I want you to explore how they, how these shoulds and your social constructs influence how you think and react. We need to challenge the beliefs that that may be unhealthy and keep from keep us from being our best selves. Remember, the hot dog is great, but it is also unhealthy. Pay attention to the messages that you get from your social environment. Try to understand how they impact your mind and your body. Challenge beliefs and attitudes that may be harmful to you and your po and possibly to others. Develop more constructive ideas about you and your social environment so that messages in your environment won't define your shoulds and should nots so much. You can be your best self. Next episode, we'll be discussing human instinctive behaviors. My dad used to say that some things we do are just come to us naturally, but the key is learning how to understand and control what comes easily. See you at our next episode. I'm sure it will be a blast.